This video will cover the single most important principle of design and composition. If your images are flat, hard to see, lacking in hierarchy, poorly designed, if it's hard to tell where to look or what is supposed to be in the foreground and background, if you've got a problem with depth, interest, mood, legibility, or clarity of your images, that's a heck of a run-on sentence. But what I'm trying to say is that this will fix a lot of problems. Contrast. You need to think deeply about contrast and be very intentional about using contrast to guide the eye of your viewer. Contrast is the only reason that humans are able to see anything at all. The deeper that you understand contrast, the more your graphic design, photography, film, illustration, and animation will improve. The contrast and HSB are the main drivers of visual perception in humans. There are many other types of contrast, and this video covers what I feel are the most important types of contrast to consider in visual communication. I will cover contrast in value, saturation, hue, size, shape, weight, theme, pattern, complexity, and style. Master these and you will eliminate a huge percentage of the problems seen in amateur design, photography, and illustration. Stick around to the end of the video where I will show you how to immediately improve your work using contrast to guide the eye. Contrast is the measurement of the difference of two or more things. When we speak about contrast, we speak in terms that describe the amount of difference. For example, you may push distracting patterns or textures into the background by having low value contrast, or draw the eye to a single focal point by having high saturation contrast. These visual terms are best understood visually. Throughout this video, you will see measurements on the screen that show contrast of hue, saturation, and brightness. Hue, or the pigment of something, saturation, the vibrance of something, and brightness, the value or how much black or white is in something. This is called HSB. These are the three components that make up color. We'll take value or brightness to illustrate. This image has no hue saturation or saturation contrast, so the only reason that you can see anything is because of the changes in how bright or dark the shapes are in comparison to each other. In other words, this image relies heavily on value contrast. The slider represents the available value from 0, completely black, to 100, completely white. Any number in between will show some level of gray based on how much black and white are mixed in. And so let's eye drop this, right? If we eye drop over here, you can see that we are at a 1% gray or almost completely black. If we eye drop here, you can see that we are at a 93%, almost completely white. And at varying degrees, you've got different things. Like here, we've got a pretty dark gray here. Here, got a pretty medium gray. Right? And so let's look at what that means. I'm gonna eye drop these and write down the values. So I'm gonna eye drop here, and that gives us a 7%, seven. And then let's eye drop up here. We'll go 42, almost white, 91%, 82, 48. Okay, and so you can see that there's this vignette situation that is drawing our eye inward, and it's using value, right? Between nine and six, let's call that low value contrast. Whereas if we go over here from seven to 91, we would consider that high value contrast, right? All along these edges here, you've got one, it stays one along these edges, it gets nine, 10, four, right? Pretty, uh, pretty solid vignette around the edge of this. Go in closer, you can see that those numbers start to raise until we get to our highest point of value contrast. And so one of the most solid rules that you've got is that your highest point of value contrast is usually your focal point. And so as we have this growing brightness here, it's brighter and brighter as it reaches the center, then we switch a really hard switch right around the central figure and we go from seven to 91. We also have leading lines that help us with that as well. So we've got all these leading lines and all of these lines that kind of frame this situation. So there's a lot of stuff that's making this work, but the value contrast is the main thing. Okay, so let's look at another one here. And so we're seeing a pretty solid gradation that goes from here over to here, radial gradient, because it's also kind of doing like there and here as well. Okay, if we go all the way out to this edge, okay, we're at one. If we come all the way in to over here, let's put a 99 right here. Let's eye drop our, eye drop our guy walking in here and he's at zero. So he's, he's a perfect black. Two up here, if 
five down here. Okay. And the floor surrounding him, we're looking at 87. Okay. So 87 to five, that's a pretty big split. But in front of him, it gets a little bit darker and we're going at 55. So this is a 55. So still pretty high value contrast from zero to 55. And then we have these edges up here. So there's differences enough to tell the difference between these. It's pretty low value contrast. This kind of like big shape and it starts to kind of like band outward. And all of that is leading us towards this high value change. And this shape that cuts in, that's the highest point of value contrast is right behind him and him. Let's talk about some images that have hue contrast or what's called color temperature contrast. Now I've shown here this wheel because you'll notice that the hue or the color is, is in degrees because it's technically a circle, right? It's the color wheel. Saturation, just like brightness, goes from zero, which is grayscale, to 100, which is totally saturated. B, again, value, goes from black to white. As I eye drop this, you can see that we change in our highlights from the warmer side to the cooler side of that kind of circle. You can see the shift down in here uh, compared to the shift up here. So we have a, we cross that line. So you, you can imagine a little line here that goes through the circle where we've got warm on one side, think things like fire and heat. And so those are your reds, your oranges, your yellows, your reddish purples, right? And you've got cooler on this other side. So think of things like water and ice, and that's your, your bluish purples, your blues, your blue greens, like those, those kind of things. Uh, green kind of sits a little bit in between, depending on how much blue or yellow is sort of mixed in. And purple kind of sits in, in between, depending on how much blue or red is mixed in, okay? And so as you see this, we are switching um, from a red to a purple, to a blue, okay? And the background is very blue, okay? So as we sit here, you can see that that doesn't shift much. And then where they're showing shadows, it also stays blue, but where they jump to highlights, it warms up considerably. And so we switch into the warmer side of that color. You go here, 79, fairly saturated, 78, fairly saturated. So between these two points, we're not seeing a lot of saturation contrast. 79 on brightness and 71 on brightness. So the only reason that we're really seeing much of a difference there, those are almost the same. There's a little line that's a little bit darker, but that is your hue contrast. So because this contrasts from a warmer color to a cooler color, um, it stands out quite a bit. Now, if I were to come in and start drawing green, okay, it's way up here, right? And so that stands out quite a bit because the rest of our colors are kind of shifting down on this opposite side. Um, and so if they really wanted something to stick out, which they're intentionally designing this so that everything kind of feels like a pattern, um, but if they really wanted things to stick out, they would add kind of like a green or a greenish blue or a, or a, or a yellowish green, and that'll, that'll get you that opposite, which is a much higher level of contrast. Very high hue contrast or color temperature contrast. If I, if I gray this out and I go into grayscale, uh, you can see that we do have pretty significant uh, value contrast, especially around here. And we've got enough value contrast going on. Again, we've got our leading lines. So you can see these leading lines kind of leading towards very much to kind of the central point. He's framed in here like this. And notice those frames are hatching, happening in switches in value, right? Um, and then he breaks out of that kind of figure there. Our focal point should be right here, right? We got our leading lines going there, boom, 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 boom. This is the highest point of value contrast. You go 20% black to a 96%. That's a pretty big spread there. And so this should be our focal point, but watch what happens as soon as we take the color. Our focal point shifts up is because of this color temperature contrast or hue contrast. On our hue, we go from 50 or a very yellow to 201 or a very blue, and look at where that jumps. We start over here in the upper right hand, okay? And we jump all the way across, almost to a complete opposite over in here. So as soon as you cross uh, color temperature, that can often lead your eye. I would say that our focal point is right here. This value contrast helps where we're going from this very bright to very dark. Also notice that down in here, 
where it is yellow in the background, we have blue. And where it is blue in the background, we have yellow. You've got orange, you've got red, you've got green, okay? And then around him, it's all blue. Notice that we have a purple balancing out a purple. We would lose that contrast if this rotated and these kind of purple uh, things were next to this purple napkin. You'd lose that hue contrast. And so we go from purple to green to red and white to purple, and we have that nice repetition of that shape, but we get these colors in between that give us that, that contrast. If you can see what's really driving this, a saturation contrast. And so let's first watch saturation, right? As I jump over here, 100% saturated on that blue, right? 38%, okay, 100%. This highly saturated boat is not the focal point. The focal point is this bridge. The main reason is because it's much less saturated. So right around it, we've got 42, 44, 40. Up here, we get into 36, and we go to 9% saturation, right? 14% saturation, 9 again, 8, 6. And so as we look at the color of this, there's a fairly significant saturation jump. So we go from 71 to 9. 95 there. So there's these big jumps where where this warmer yellowish is is jumping in saturation. Let's take a look at the hue, okay? This is going to be a warm color, warm color, warm color, right? Notice notice I'm watching this hue right here or I'm watching this outer circle, okay? And it all kind of stays in there in this kind of range up here. But when I jump over here, look, the background, which seems kind of brownish, is actually a dark blue. We're getting a very subtle, but very powerful hue contrast, and then a very obvious value contrast, and then a very obvious saturation contrast. Okay, a little bit of comic book action. We've got Dave Stewart here uh, as the colorist. So as we, as we look at this and as we eye drop, you can see this is a very desaturated yellow, right? We're, we're at 39% brightness and we're at 30% saturation. And so that yellow, it almost doesn't even feel like yellow. We switch into some blue tones, but still very desaturated at 16% and uh, pretty dark at 26%. You jump over into these blacks, it's just a pure black, right? Jump over here, uh, this kind of warms up a little bit. Right, and so we shift over into the red category, um, but at 22% saturation and 33% brightness, it's still desaturated and kind of a lower medium value. Okay, here we jump into the orange and yellow again. Uh, we've got some we've got some greens and some blues, but notice how as I jump around here, the saturation and the brightness uh, they don't change that much. Right, and so even though the hue is shifting from kind of a purple uh, to to a blue to a green, you know, to a yellow, there's a lot of hue shifts, keeping that saturation low and keeping that brightness pretty low. And then we hit our main character or our focal point, and we jump in saturation significantly: seventy-eight percent saturation and seventy-four percent brightness. So just around there, we go from thirty-two percent, okay, to seventy percent. This is the only thing that is a high contrast, warm tone, um, and so it stands out quite a bit. That draws our eye fairly significantly to the one thing. We got this one guy right here, and he is standing out because he has high saturation and high brightness, and so he stands out significantly because everything over here is low saturation. He is bright red, high saturation red, and everything else is going to be low saturation, low brightness. Lightning round. I'm going to speed up here. Next up size contrast. Size contrast can happen in two main ways. One is abstracting the size of things for the composition, and the other is showing the actual size of things relative to the other things. A common trope is to have in an ensemble movie to have these stacked character posters. And the stacked character poster uh, utilizes the abstract sizing. Okay, Bonus points if you've got a big looming giant bad guy in the background on the top. But we don't actually think that he is 
significantly larger than him. We just think uh, in relative size, we just think that we're kind of filling in space. And so you get these kind of ideas here um, of the shape of things, but there's no expectation that the size that's actually happening here is an actual size. You've got Star Wars, you know, main character, and then kind of minor characters in, in varying degrees of pyramid shapes. We're getting a lot of that kind of triangular action going on. Okay, very similar layout here, um, but we get a little bit more arcing, circular. This is one of the more famous ones, right? Big giant head floating in the background that's actually bigger than the Death Star. But we're not actually saying that Darth Vader's head is three times the size of the Death Star. Size is showing importance. It's not showing logic as far as, you know, thinking that this person is 60 feet tall, but she is more important of a character than he is or him. They actually get smaller as you go down based on importance. These guys are just fodder. They, they don't even have any individuality. And so they're, they're almost just kind of like little ants at the bottom there. Uh, old sci-fi books that have been turned into shows, the special ops guy. You, know, you can do different shapes of these things and it'll give you different stuff, right? Live action anime remakes, kind of do that a bit. Notice our big looming bad guy as well. We got some of those, so kind of fun. So you can recognize like, you know, 11 here, big looming, big bad groups of abstract sized characters kind of like comic book movies as well and a lot of these they just have there's just a ton of people extra points for having kind of your arms stretched out lots of that type of thing but the the idea is that you're you're using size contrast to show the importance uh, or the hierarchy of where you should look first. You can go more into the abstract again here, and this is a little bit different than a collage element that you would see in those stacked characters. And you start to wonder like, is this some kaiju cat that is bigger than a whale? Like, is that, what, is that what's going on, right? It is a little bit of an abstraction because we've got kind of the moon here and the planes and things, but this cat compared to this whale, we know whales are very, very big and we know cats are very, very small. Kind of montage collage element over here. We don't assume that these soldiers right here are inside of this guy's neck somehow, but that this is his reaction to, you know, some things that are going on. This guy being smaller than this giant bear and the wilderness that's kind of around him. Simple things like phones. This is a much bigger phone than you would get in a life-size situation. And so having, having kind of the blue here and the blue here, it relates them. Um, having the kind of the same colors here and here, it relates them and they're looking at each other and they're roughly the same size, but having those be the same size when they should be that fits in her hand, showing that outsized abstraction kind of kind of carries that message, right? We're having this situation where we've got this big giant thing and each one of these apps is half the size of a person. These little people saying that, you know, that we are basically uh, slave to or diminished by the technology that surrounds us, which looms over us. It fills the background with all these ones and zeros, and we are working for the technology. And so making the people be very small compared to the giant, even bleeding off the edge of the screen kind of presence of the phone there uh, is what's getting that across. That size contrast and abstraction kind of gets that across. This would be more relative local size. These people are this size. She is significantly smaller than him and higher than him. And so we assume that she is further back. And then we have this size comparison of this big giant building. And so a lot of these will use some sort of framing. And so we've got this little character here, and then we've got this big giant frame up here, big building in the background and large trees and kind of the rocks are kind of framing this in. But the comparison is that look at this big giant structure and look at this little person, right? Look at this big giant structure and look at this little person. Look at the little person next to the giant trees, next to the big giant trees off in the distance, next to the big mountain full of trees, this, this tiny little person. Look at these tiny little people and then this smaller person that's over here and then these big, tall. Notice that we're playing with the verticality of those things. There's lots of giant vertical elements. They even kind of bend in a little bit over here and they bend in a little bit over here so that they they look a little bit like they're looming right we have a little bit of that fisheye it's not significant but we do have kind of that that curvature so it looks a little bit looming but the idea is right they are small and nature is giant they are small and nature is giant right here's a little house and it is 
inside of giant things. We've got the triangle here, the repetition of the triangle here and the triangle here, right? Um, and so it kind of feel it fits into that kind of rhythm of kind of coming down this direction, this direction, coming down this direction and kind of over. Um, this being a focal point because of the hue contrast um, and because of the size contrast. It's the only thing in here that is small. Big giant group of trees compared to one single small lone tree. And then we have several groups of trees. They come in threes, so you can kind of use the rule of odds. We've got three of those and one of these to further accentuate the loneliness. But look at the size difference of that. This takes up quite a bit of room. This takes up not a lot of room. This one here is even a little bit more simple. We've just got some things, but some of these rocks get bigger and bigger, and then there are other ones that are smaller. If all of these rocks were exactly the same size, we wouldn't have as much depth. We've got some trees that are bigger, some trees that are medium size, and some trees that are smaller. And so we have a variation in size. I try to have at least three different size things. So that helps with the hierarchy. Uh, but if you can hit five, that's even better. Let's continue to shape. Here we have kind of UPA cartoon modern and you see lots of rectangles with curvy shapes, right? So these curvy shaped characters with curvy shaped instruments are surrounded by square things. And so in shape contrast, you're just comparing, you know, one shape to another shape. These kind of circle circular lines, they are we're cutting them up with these straight lines, right? And so not only is this a good contrast of hue, saturation, and brightness, we also have this contrast of straight lines versus round things, right? Round things versus straight things. Straight, pointy, straight, pointy, and round, and round, and round, and round. You've got the round thing, and then you've got all of these little points kind of breaking that up. But that kind of oval shape is continued throughout until we go right in there. This circle over here is being broken up by lots of rectangles and straight lines. The geometric uh, triangular elements of the of the arm, big round thing, and then grids everywhere. Just straight lines, 90 degree angles. Notice all of these round shapes, very round, and then surrounded by rectangles. Round shapes, swooping, round, swooping, round, swooping. And these are even in a circle, but surrounded by lots of rectangles. So in this one, we've got the low contrast or repetition of these curve shapes to the letter forms, right? And so you see these curves and these curves and these curves, right? And then the contrast in that shape comes in this grid, uh, these kind of rectangles that break in. So we've got a bunch of concentric circles here in the middle, and then we break into and contrast that with rectangles. We've got straight lines, straight lines, straight lines, straight lines, all diagonal straight, except for right here and right here. Everything else is pretty straight. And then the letter forms themselves are these kind of swoopy curved situations. And so we have the shape of those. We've got straight sans serif bold, We've got a uh, lightly weighted swoopy script font. Now let's move on to weight, okay? When we move on to weight, we are generally talking about line weight. In a lot of situations, you'll see a heavy containment line on the outside of the shape and then detailed smaller lines on the inside. And so you see these lines of detail here, especially like in the hair, heavy, heavy, heavy containment line on the outside, and then these detailed lines on the inside. You can see that a little bit more nuanced here, heavy lines on the outside, and then these very light kind of marks on the inside. And we contrast that as you see like this neck fur on the shoulder or the bottom of the cheek on top of the neck, we start to get thicker lines again to kind of draw the attention to that. And then we get these thinner textural lines to kind of draw the attention away from that. Uh, this one is is very much thick containment line and then thin detail lines and then dotted lines, thick containment lines next to thin detail lines and thick containment lines next to thin little marks, right? You got these big thicker lines on the outside to contain the outside of that shape. And then on the inside, we've got these little, little lines, very big, giant, thick, colored black outside. And then on the inside, we get these thin, sharp tapering. On the inside here, we get a lot smaller lines than we have on the outside here. All of these have kind of that situation where you're looking at big kind of thicker lines down to thinner tapering lines, thicker containment lines on the outside, 
and then thinner detailed lines on the inside. That is weight contrast. Thematic contrast is one of my favorite types of contrast. It's the contrast of ideas, the contrast of moods or emotions. So you have things like physicality versus emotionality, death versus life, nostalgia uh, versus kind of like adulthood or rot, right? And so these are like playful childhood characters, uh, but we've subverted that thematically, contrasting them with like the undead. Or she looks bored, but her life is being threatened. And so her response to this life-threatening situation is in contrast to the life-threatening situation, right? Being being unimpressed. Or these types of things where it's it's a subversion of the, of the general idea, right? And so dating a robot because people date people, uh, but we don't date robots. But that idea is a thematic contrast or somebody who's very well put together, maybe like a captain, but underneath he is a merchant of death, right? You have uh, kind of this idea of like these gentlemen sea captains, you know, that are educated and part of the gentry and those types of things. And then they go out and they rain death and horror on things. Motion versus stillness. It's all just the idea of contrasting concepts, contrasting moods, contrasting vibes, contrasting themes. And so you try to find pairs of things and show how you can subvert it or contrast that thing. On the home stretch now, stick with me, we're almost done. So pattern contrast, remember we're talking about the difference or the comparison of two different things. And so you can have simple things like this where uh, it changes in hue or in brightness. You can have literal things like this where something comes in and actually breaks up that pattern. Or you can have a little bit more symbolic things where something is coming in and kind of disrupting that pattern. So let's look at a couple examples here. We've got different types of patterns on different types of patterns. So we see this wind and these swirls in the water or on the brick or we've got the same pattern that is getting disrupted you see this um, there's a lot of similarity um, and and the main difference in these patterns is going to be in the in the density or in the detail of that whereas over here we've got a lot of circular things um, next to a lot of angular things you could say that stairs are a pattern right we're very used to them we see them all the time we use them all the time and so when they get disrupted like this we are breaking that pattern you can see here that the uh, the pattern of the window is repeated here and then these people break that pattern or contrast that pattern um, we have a bit of a texture pattern here that is kind of depicting the rain and where we have that stop or get much brighter um, it, it defines a figure there okay same thing here kind of breaking that out and so that's pattern contrast now let's take a look at complexity contrast and this is where you have areas of complexity versus areas of simplicity and so here we can see a rather complex situation we've got people we've got little suggestions of wood grain we've got reflections in the water and everything the background we don't even have a horizon very very simple in the background right just basically a gradient same thing here all of this area very very simple very very simple and then we get into a lot more complexity as we get into this area here you can also see that in the use of negative space we've got some sergio Tapi art here we've got some pulp covers and notice that there's a bit of a subversion of the space here so you can see that normally we would see her dress and what's going on there but they've subverted that by using the simplicity of that negative space versus the complexity of everything that's going on in the background but we go from complex to simple now these if this was all as busy as it is here it would be it would be just a wash of black and it'd be really hard to understand what's going on but notice what Toppy is doing here is we have these areas of negative space or simplicity that help break this up so that we can get that silhouette, get, figure out what's going on in the image. It reads much clearer because we have those areas of complexity versus the areas of simplicity. It can be different styles as well. Uh, notice that the color here is in the actual background, but the complexity here is in the sketched lines. We see lots of different um, lines to kind of depict motion and look at all of the negative space that's going on around here. There's tons of negative space. And then the background gets much more simple compared to the very detailed foreground here. We've got individual rocks and cracks in those rocks. And then we've got very simple trees, low value contrast. You're contrasting areas of complexity uh, on top of or near or next to or underneath areas of simplicity to allow some breathing room and, and to form and silhouette.
Style is the last one that we're going to talk about. Style contrast is basically that you're mixing different styles. Now, we've got a whole movie here where the point of the movie is to have a bunch of different styles because each one of these characters or is from a different dimension or different different universe, right? Different styles in there. You can kind of see how that uh, is working together, but she is more of a 3D render. She is more of a flat cartoon shaded situation, cartoon shaded, but with half tone cartoon shaded with half tones but in grayscale and so there's these little minor shifts that help us kind of understand the difference in style there and uh, you can you can make it a lot more extreme where we've got in the second film you've got Hobie here um, that is very different than everybody else um, in style and it, and it works because of the narrative of the, of the story the gorillas do this quite often where we've got animated characters next to live action characters or animated characters next to live action backgrounds happens happens quite a bit you can have that different style in the in the technique as well and so over here we've got a big big broad flat brush right and then we've got dripped dripping paint going on right kind of splatters jackson pollock situation in the middle here you'll notice that the bear is the only thing in this that has much of a uh, line work there's a little bit of line work in the trees that are supposed to be in the midground with him uh, we lose that line work in the foreground we lose that line work in the background and so it helps him stand out a little bit in style not not huge style contrast but a uh, minor style contrast that helps us out with that and then we've got a very vector illustrative situation and the background becomes uh, more like splatter and textural, but there's no texture on her. So it's, it's, it's a style contrast. Contrast and style is often used in animation, especially old school animation. You can see it in Cuphead. You can see it in a lot of the rubber hose stuff where they're going to have like a watercolor background and then a, a more inked or drawn or vector characters. And doing that helps contrast things. If everything had a containment line on it, then it would be a lot harder to kind of follow what was what, um, whereas you're using a little bit of that atmospheric perspective, things getting less detailed as they get further away from us by not having containment lines or detailed lines or ink lines um, in the background or the scene or the elements that are not the characters. Where is your eye drawn to? What would you consider the focal point of this image? Remember this rule. The focal point is typically the highest point of value contrast. If you're having trouble guiding the viewer's eye to your focal point, start by increasing the value contrast around your focal point and decreasing the value contrast elsewhere in the image. After using value contrast, start layering other types of contrast to control the flow of the viewer's eye. You don't have to use all of these different types of contrast and many of them will overlap with each other. You can start with color. You've already done value and you can do saturation and hue. Size is a very big one. Shape is effective. Weight works well if you are using lines. Theme, pattern, complexity, style are also options. Several of these types of contrast layered on top of each other are the most effective ways to guide the viewer's eye or control the hierarchy of your image. Start with value and then move on to two or three more.